Shalom, shalom, and howdy, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Midrash, Midrash series with me, Batya Insvat, as usual. Thank God. All right. Okay, friends, you know, we're still, we're, I would say about a third of the way through the book of Vaikra, pop quiz. What does Vaikra mean? And he called him. Great. So we're about a third of the way through. We know that Vaikra, Leviticus, Vaikra is laws, 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 laws. And we are still toiling in Torah within the laws. So yes, for those of you who are committed, we are still going on about the laws of the Metzora, the leper, the sacrifice, the sacrifice, I was going to say the sacrifice and purification process and what that looked like. Let's do it. Let's buckle down with the help of Hashem and learn these laws about Tzaharat, the purification of the leper who is declared tahor, clean, or pure, tahor, also. This is a word that you will hear a lot, tahor, meaning it says clean, but also pure. Okay, so let us assume that an isolated leper one day discovered the, that the signs of impurity, two white hairs, or spots of raw flesh within the disease area had disappeared. If so, he would call for the Kohen to come and examine him. The Kohen was required to come on that same day to examine him. If he could discern no symptoms of Tuma, impurity, he immediately began the purification process. The Kohen ordered that a new earthenware bowl and two living birds of identical appearance be brought to him without delay. He filled the earthenware bowl with fresh spring water and slaughtered one bird over it, pressing out its blood until the water was colored by it. The slaughtered bird was buried since it was not permissible for use. Thereafter, the Kohen assembled four items, which had to be immersed in the mixture of the water and the blood. A stick of cedar wood, a hyssop twig, a string of wool dyed crimson red, and the living bird. He tied together the cedar stick, the hyssop twig with the crimson string, holding these and the live bird in the same hand. He dipped all four simultaneously into the liquid in the earthenware vessel. Thereafter, he used this bundle to sprinkle some of the liquid in the bowl seven times on the back of the leper's hand. Finally, the living bird was sent to freedom outside the city walls. It is beyond us to comprehend the mystical spiritual force of these actions, which the creator ordained for the leper's purification. Nevertheless, we gain some insight into their spiritual significance by studying the words of our sages. They explain that every part of the ceremony was a part, was a parting admonition to the leper upon his recommencing life in society. The falling out are <laughs> English, yeah. The following are the moral lessons hinted to him. Birds are used for his purification to remind him. Do you know why you contracted the disease of Tzaharat? You chattered too much. Regarding this bird who constantly twitters, didn't you act in the past like a thoughtless twittering bird? Next, of the two birds, one was slaughtered and the other set free. This evoked in the leopard the following thought. If you maintain your improved spiritual standard, the disease will not befall you again, just as the slaughtered bird never returns to life. However, if you revert to your sinful habits, the disease may yet return to you, just as the bird dismissed into the field may return. Next, binding together the cedar, which is the tallest of trees, and the hyssop, the lowliest of the herbs, should lead him to realize that Hashem punishes a person who becomes too haughty who considers himself a cedar tree, reducing him to the humiliating state of the leper who is lowly like the hyssop grass. 
Next, the red string was a symbol of the leper's sin, since sin is likened to scarlet thread. Moreover, the string was dyed red with the blood of a worm to cause the leper to refrain from future sinning by calling to mind the end of every human being. His flesh becomes the prey of worms. Next, the breakable earthenware bowl symbolizes the position of the human being in this world. He is like a mere earthenware vessel, frail and vulnerable. And finally, the fresh spring water in the terminology of our sages represents Torah. The water is sprinkled on the leopard seven times, connoting that he should study Torah. After the living bird had been dismissed, the leper was shaved by the Kohen. The Kohen removed all visible hair by means of a razor. If he neglected to shave even two single hairs, the entire shaving was invalid and had to be repeated before the next stage of purification could begin. The shaving marked the purification of the skin on which the symptoms of the Tzarat had appeared. The purifying leper had to immerse himself and his garments in a mikvah. Thereupon, he was again allowed entry into a walled city. Nevertheless, he was still impure, being considered a primary source of uncleanliness, who defiled others on contact. He was not permitted to live with his wife, nor into, enter the temple mount, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> nor partake of the korbanot. Pop quiz, what does korbanot mean? Sacrifices. Excellent. And other hallowed food. He had to count seven days, and on the seventh he was shaved by the Kohen a second time and immersed himself in his garments into the mikvah. The final act of purification took place on the eighth day by his offering of the sacrifices of the purifying of the leper. Only thereafter was he allowed to partake of sacrifices once again. The offering of the sacrifices by the leper on the eighth day constituted the final stage of their purification. A rich man offered the following sacrifices. A lamb as a asham sacrifice, a female lamb as a chatat sacrifice, a lamb as an ola sacrifice, and a mich, uh, mincha nesachim, consisting of three etronim, about 15 pounds of flour, and a log of oil. If the leper was a poor man, he offered a lamb to be brought as an asham sacrifice, a turtle dove or a pigeon as a chatat sacrifice, a turtle dove or a pigeon as an ola, and a minchat netzachim, consisting of an omer, approximately five pounds of flour, and a log, about a quart of oil. Although in the case of other sacrifices, a rich man who offered the sacrifice of a pauper nevertheless fulfilled his duty. This was not so in the case of a wealthy leper who brought a poor man's offerings. His sacrifice would not be able... Uh, to be acceptable, since one of the causes of tsarat is being a miser. If a wealthy man attempted to save money by offering a poor man's sacrifice, he thereby proved that he had not changed his character, and the sacrifice could not atone for him. The sacrifices were meant to arouse the former leper to repentance, particularly for the sin of having spoken Lashon Hara. After the Kohen performed the usual avoda of receiving the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkling some of it onto the walls of the altar, two special avodas were required with the sham sacrifices. Avoda is like um, service or acts of service specifically. Matan Hadam, placing the sacrifice's blood on the leper. The Kohen poured some of the, the sacrifice's blood into his left hand and walked over to the leper. The leper was not yet permitted to enter the courtyard of the Beit HaMikdash, but stood outside it, inclining only his head into the Azara. Courtyard. Azara. Courtyard. Um, the Kohen, who stood in the, the Azara, placed some of the blood in the leper's right ear. The leper stretched his right arm into the courtyard, and the Kohen placed some blood on his thumb. The leper put out his right foot, and the Kohen placed some blood on his largest toe. And Matan Shimon, placing oil on the leper. A Kohen took some of the log of oil, dipped his right finger into it, and sprinkled it seven times towards the Holy of Holies. Dipping his finger into the oil before each sprinkling, he walked to the leper and placed some of the oil in the same spots where he had put the blood in his ear, on the thumb on his right hand, and the big toe of his right foot. He placed the rest of the oil in his hand and on the leopard's head. Now, Tzaharat, leprosy on, on the houses. The Torah concludes the laws of Tzaharat. 
we're concluding the laws of Tsarat. Just making a note. By describing the symptoms and treatment of Tsarat on houses, this Tsarat appeared as dark red or green spots on the wall. The emergence of symptoms of Tsarat on walls was not found among any nation except the Jewish people. Like all the other types of Tsarat, it was a miracle which demonstrated Hashem's special providence and concern for Klal Israel. Although Hashem usually caused Tsarat to break out first on the walls of a house as a warning and only later on the person's body, the Torah reverses the order in discussing the different types. It deals with the laws of Tsarat on houses at the end for two reasons. One, the subject of Tzarat was taught to the children of Israel in the wilderness where they did not own houses but were surrounded by the clouds of glory. Hashem said, in the desert, Tzarat will immediately affect your bodies if you sin. In the future, when you will be settled in the land, it will first appear on the walls of your houses. Two, the Torah initially discusses Tzarat on the human body in order to intimidate us and thus prevent us from sinning. In practice, however, the Almighty was merciful, and the symptoms of Zarat did not immediately emerge on a person's body, but first on the walls of their house. Now, there are several reasons why Hashem caused someone's house to be stricken with spots of Zarat, and some of them are very surprising. One, firstly, as we explained, it might constitute a preliminary heavenly warning that the owner of this house or a family member was guilty of some severe offense such as Lashon Hara, and unless they did teshuva, tshuva, repentance, the leprosy would proceed to befall his garments and finally his body. Or else the tzarat symptoms indicated that the master of the house who was a miser, claiming that he was without means, refused to lend some items of his belongings to others, and when the spots of leprosy appeared on the walls of his house, his vessels had to be cleared out. The truth then became evident since everyone was able to survey the entire contents of his home. Another cause might have been that this man's possessions were acquired dishonestly. He had gathered them into his house by means of thievery, and therefore Hashem caused them to be expelled for everyone to see. Tzarat also befell a home whose owner was conceited, priding himself on its beauty and elegance. It was therefore demolished in accordance with the dictum in Proverbs 15.25. Hashem, it's Mishle, really. Hashem will pluck up the house of the proud. The owner was thereby reminded that the Almighty does not want a Jew to think that the goal of life is furnishing and improving his home in the world. Rather, we should exert ourselves to collect furniture for our home in the next world. Please, God. What was a Jew required to do if he noticed the appearance of colored spots on the walls of his house? He personally, and not a messenger, had to go to a Kohen to inform him of the news. This unpleasant errand was meant to humiliate him giving him the rats on the will to start making repentance. Only a Jew living in Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, was um, obliged to pay attention to spots on the walls, and not one who resided outside the Holy Land. For these same symptoms did not defile, the out, did not defile outside of the land. Eretz Israel possesses a special Kedusha, holiness. It cannot uh, contain transgressors, right? It's really interesting because it's a concept in Israel that the land itself can, will spit out people. Like, uh, it's a really interesting because people that live here, they know it's true. If the land doesn't want you, it will spit you out. And if it calls you, then you're lucky. Where were we? Okay, I got distracted. Where were we? Sorry about that. Ah. So. In the city of Jerusalem, no house could ever be declared Tameh, impure. The reason for this exceptional status of Jerusalem was that the city was not the private property of a particular tribe. Rather, it was considered the common possession of all of the nation of Israel. The Torah decreed that the laws of Tuma, impurity, only applied to privately owned houses. 
It was the Cohen's duty to address with reproving words that the man who brought him news of his house being stricken lest he a a attribute it to a coincidence. My son, the Cohen admonished him, remember that this plague appears as a punishment for a severe sin such as Lashon Hara. Take heart to it and make repentance. The Cohen then came to inspect the house. First of all, he ordered that all articles therein be cleared out so they would not become defiled should the house be declared impure. Tame. This Torah law is evident of Hashem's great concern not only for a Jew's health and safety, but even for his property. Even if he were a Rasha, for the man whose house was stricken certainly belonged in the category of a Rasha, someone wicked, the opposite of righteous. The only items which the owner might have lost if his house was declared impure were earthenware dishes. Defiled metal vessels and garments could be purified in a mikveh. <clears throat> Only earthenware vessels, if defiled, could never be purified. It follows then that Hashem enacted a special law to clear all the belongings from someone's house in order to spare him from the possible loss of cheap earthenware vessels. Before inspecting the walls, the Kohen first ascertained whether the house was built according to the specifications necessary for it to become Tameh. Only a house possessing certain qualifications became impure. For example, it had to possess four corners, a roundhouse was never declared impure. Also, all four walls had to contain stone, wood, and earth. If one of its walls was not comprised of all three of these components, the house could not become tame. If the Kohen found the house qualified to become impure, tame, he proceeded to examine the plague itself. If he saw the wall green or red spots or a combination of the two, he closed the house for seven days and on the seventh, he re-inspected it. Inspection at the end of one week. At this reinspection, the following cases could occur. One, the spots might have turned lighter or disappeared altogether. If this is the case, all the Cohen had to do was to scrape the area of the plague thereafter he declared the house pure. Two, if the color of the spots was the same as previously and the spots had neither spread nor disappeared, he closed the house for a second week. Three, if the spots had spread, the Cohen ordered the stones and earth of the diseased area removed, replacing them with different ones, and then the house was closed for observation for another week. So now we're at the inspection at the end of the second week. If the spots had turned lighter or disappeared, the house was pronounced pure. However, after this period to complete its purification, two birds had to be brought, of which one was slaughtered over fresh spring water and the other sent away free, fulfilling the same details as commanded for the leper's purification. In the case of a house, however, the blood of the slaughtered bird was sprinkled seven times on the doorpost. Two, if at the end of that week, the Taharat spots had not changed for the better or they had spread, the Kohen removed all the stones with the Taharat symptoms and closed the house for a third additional week. Three, if the Taharat spots returned to the stones which had been newly inserted at the end of the first week, the house was Tameh and it was demolished. Can you imagine, like, your whole house was demolished? Like, your house, your house was demolished. I mean, <laughs> in the times that we live in now, lucky if you get to own a house. But uh, that would, I mean, that would definitely keep me on the straight and narrow. Probably. Maybe, maybe not. It's hard to say. Inspection at the end of the third week. If the Tzarat spots had returned to the newly inserted stones, the house was declared impure and the entire house had to be completely demolished again. If the spots had not returned, the house required the same purification process as that required for a leprous person. Thereafter, it was declared pure. If a Jew entered a house which had been declared Tameh, he became defiled and had to immerse himself in a mikveh. If he stayed in such a house for a length of time termed uh, paras, approximately three minutes, even his garments became defiled and needed purification in the mikvah. How are we doing on time? We are doing good. All right. All righty. How appropriate. I don't know I said that it's not really in connection to absolutely anything we were talking about, but I mean, it is because it's what we were just talking about, but 
What am I talking about? Hashem's punishments are a blessing in disguise. I know you guys have heard me say it before, but one of my favorite sayings is, um, a curse is only an unwanted blessing. I like it so much because I want to remember it because I want to integrate it and actually really, really believe it. Someday, please, God. All right. All of Hashem's punishments are, in reality, a blessing in disguise. This can be seen from the example of spots of leprosy appearing on the houses. When the Kananim learned of the eventual entry of the Jews into the land, they took great pains to parry. Parry. Hop. They took great pains to bury all their treasures <laughs> so that they should not fall into Jewish hands. Said the Almighty, I promise the forefathers a land filled with precious things, and I will fulfill that promise. The Almighty therefore caused spots of Tzarat to break out on the walls of certain houses so that it had to be demolished to the owner's despair. Its walls were torn down. Suddenly... Glittering piles of gold and silver revealed themselves to the eye. The owner unexpectedly found himself in possession of wealth which he had never dreamt possible. Now, the Midrash seems, this Midrash seems surprising um, because why is he being rewarded with gold and silver? Because he got to that place by sinning and then being struck with the punishment of leprosy, right, it doesn't make sense. So then why would he deserve to find a treasure? So it says that the tzaddikim, the righteous, discovered the fortune in store for them with ease. Hashem caused them to settle on the property on which the Canaanim had, ha had hidden their money in easily detectable places, such as in the fields where they dug up the treasures as soon as they, they tilled the land. Other Jews, however, did not deserve an immediate blessing to find it. It was only after experiencing the shock of the Tzaharat spots appearing on their walls due to their sins, after having to humiliate themselves to report this to the Kohen, and having been shaken by the tragedy of seeing their home broken down, did they really make repentance. And if they proved the worthy to become owners of a fortune, Hashem then allowed them to find the treasure destined for them. All of Hashem's doings are intended for our benefit, even if we do not realize it. A person should therefore accustom himself to enunciate concerning all events which befall him, whether they seem good or evil, whatever is affected by heaven is for the best. This is, this is, this is so deep in Jewish faith and belief, like this idea. Whatever is happening is the best I'm not saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not saying I'm on the level that I am oh, I'm on this level. It's a goal to really be in a place and a state of mind that everything that is happening to you is from Hashem and has purpose. And there's nothing, 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 nothing better for you than what he's giving you. It's such an important idea. And that anything that happens to you, God signed off on that. He knows why, only he knows why. But that mamish, really, everything we say, hakola tova, everything is for the good. And this is one of the most favorite stories about Rabbi Akiva. All right. All right, so Rabbi Akiva, probably this, this whole concept of Gamzu Latova comes from one Nachamish Gamzu, who is buried like a 10 minute walk from here, who was famous for saying Gamzu Latova, this is also for the good. And Nachamish Gamzu was the teacher of the great Rabbi Akiva. So, and this is, what, this is one of the most famous stories. 
Rabbi Akiva once traveled on the road, and with him, among other things, were a donkey, a rooster to wake him up in the morning, and a candle. As night fell, he halted at the entrance of a village and asked for lodging, and he was refused. And he said, All right, this is also for the good. So then, as he started preparing himself to spend the night in a field near the forest, while he was settling down, <laughs> a lion emerged and devoured his donkey. Shocking as it was, Rabbi Akiva said, this also must be for the good. Then what happened? A cat attacked his rooster and ripped him to pieces. And upon seeing this, Rabbi Akiva said, this also must be good. This also must be a very good thing. Hmm. Mm. And then wind came and blew over his candle, and he was left in the dark. And he said, hmm, this must also be a very good thing. So despite all of these things that happened, he never lost it. He just knew that everything that had, bef had befallen, befallen, everything that had befallen him, is that right? Befallen him? Maybe. So as it happens, that very night, a regiment of wild thieves overran the neighborhood, looting and stabbing on all sides. Then they invaded the village where Rabbi Akiva had sought admittance, plundering and wreaking destruction everywhere. When Rabbi Akiva learned of the events, he declared, this affirms the truth of the maxim, whatever heaven does is for the best. Had my candle been lit, the robbers would have seen me. Had the donkey or the rooster been alive, they would have betrayed my presence by their braying and crowing. Hashem caused these minor misfortunes to strike me in order to spare me from a fate far more cruel. Our sages explain that two contradictory verses in Shira Shirim, Song of Songs, Songs of Solomon. And they are, one is, um, they are black as a raven. Their appearance resembles the Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. Refer to those Torah sections which, dis which discuss Nidus, Tzarat, and Zivus. Zivut. And similar topics. Okay, these appear ugly like a black raven, and it seems improper um, to discuss these topics. What are we talking about? We're talking about, I, I'm, I'm talking about Nida, Zahara, and Z Z Z Z Z Aziv and Aziva. These are all kinds of uh, impurity. And so what we're talking about I don't know, just to make more sense of it, right? Is, so the leprosy, uh, you become impure and the laws of that. Then you have the laws of uh, Aziva and Aziva, which are also uh, bodily impurities, depending on certain kinds of bleeding for a woman and also uh, uh, emissions for a man, I believe. And then when we're talking about Nita, we're talking about a woman's monthly cycle. And it gets something you probably don't know. It gets graphic because a woman has her monthly cycle. And when she, the laws are very complicated, she has to, she, she bleeds for a certain amount of time. Once the cessation of the blood stops, she has a period of seven days where she has to check herself to make sure that she's clean. Once she is clean, she has to prepare herself to immerse in a mikvah. Um, and so like there is, there are rabbis that are dedicated to checking pieces of cloth with blood stains to decide if a woman is pure or impure, very complicated laws. 
So what I just said to you, it's, it's pretty graphic, uh, I should think. And so what we're saying here is that these things that we're talking about, period blood, emissions, leprosy, sores, that it's saying these appear ugly, like a black raven. And it seems like something inappropriate to discuss in public. However, Hashem declared, the laws concerning these subjects are pleasing before me. This is evident from the fact that the Torah does not condense them, but rather devotes a lengthy amount of time talking about these various types of uncleanliness, of impurity, discussing separately those of a man and a woman's impurity, the laws of Tuma and Tahara are dear to Hashem because they testify to the special holy character of the Jewish people. The same symptoms appearing... Um, sorry, I lost my place. So is that these topics... These same subjects are not sometimes the most comfortable subjects to talk about. But within the Jewish world, if it's written in the Torah, if it's written in the Torah, there's nothing shameful about it. There's a time and a place to discuss certain things. I probably didn't do it in the best way right here, uh, actually. But to understand that these things that seem eh, are so precious to Hashem, and he has a lengthy amount of laws about how to become pure. And we've talked about this before. Why? Be holy like me. God's all about that, right? Be holy like me. Why? Why? Because in the physical world, the way you get close to something is proximity. But in, in the spiritual world, <laughs> these, this doesn't exist. So how do you become like something in a spiritual way if you can't close distance because distance, time, and space doesn't even exist? How do you become close to something? You become like that thing. So in a way, it's God asking us, I'm giving you all these laws and all these rituals and all these things you can do to purify yourself because when you purify yourself, you become more like me. And when you become more like me, you're closer to me. And I want to be as close to you as possible. Yeah! Love it! It's amazing. It's so amazing. Everything. The Torah. But especially the Midrash. Chef's kiss. Midrash. All day. Okay. Where was I? So, because of the Jewish nation, in whose midst the Shechina... The divine present rests, it's required that the people maintained a very high level of purity and holiness. There's so many things I want to say right now, but I don't want to get I don't want to get lost in my crazy mind. Okay, so so the Torah discusses the Jewish laws concerning alachot. Halachas, you'll also hear it both said both ways, halachot and halachas. Concerning someone who finds himself tame as a result of certain physical conditions. So, if a man, this is a zav, if a man has an issue from his reproductive organs, he becomes tame and defiles others. Men, women go to the mikvah after their monthly cycle. Men go to the mikvah, they can go multiple times a day. Uh, it's, it's, it's praiseworthy if a man can go to the mikvah every day. So, that's just a little bit of that. So, he becomes tame and defiles others. If the issue occurred twice, it was termed zivut. He had to count seven clean days and immerse himself in a living spring or a well for purification. If the, the incident occurred three times, during the existence of the Beta Mikdash, he counted seven clean days after the sickness ended and immersed himself in a spring or well. On the eighth day, he offered a sacrifice termed uh, Korban Hazav, consisting of two turtle doves or two pigeons, one offered as a chatat, sin offering, and the other as an olah, 
uh, like a thank you. Not a thank you because that's really a hoda. But it's a, it's a free will offering. A free will offering. An hola. And if you don't know, then you should go back and listen to the sacrifices video. Maybe I should also go back and listen to the sacrifices video. A man is stricken uh, with this as a punishment for his sins. Among the millions of Jews who stood at the foot of Har Sinai and exclaimed, Na se venishma, we will do, and then we will hear. There was not a single zav, leper, blind, deaf, dumb, slow-witted person, because at this moment they were all free of sin, they were all free of ailments. A short while thereafter, however, those who served the golden calf were immediately stricken with tzarat or zivut. At a later point, Hashem punished some of the people with these illnesses for jeering at Moshe's family, calling Moshe's family a family of lepers. Um, so what does that mean? Why? What does that mean, calling Moshe's family a family of lepers? So the members of Moshe's family, at some point or another, were all stricken with Sarat. Moshe himself was punished with Sarat when the Almighty persuaded him to bring the Jews out of Egypt. He doubted that he would be accepted as a leader and said to Hashem, They will not believe in me. Hashem caused his hand to be covered with Sarat to punish him for having spoken unfavorably about the nation of Israel. Aaron and Miriam, too, were temporarily smitten with Sarat when they spoke Lashon Hara about Moshe, as we'll talk about further down. Although their intentions were noble, they were punished. Remember, one of the six remembrances, the daily remembrances, is that Miriam spoke Lashon Hara. Some Jews were envious of the fact that every member of Moshe's family had been elevated to a high position. They therefore vindicated, uh, vindictively noted that the family was a family of lepers. In return, Hashem smote the slanderers with Sarat and Zivud. Another offense which caused some Jews in the wilderness to be stricken with Sarat or Zivud was their making disparaging remarks about the Aaron. They commented, the Aaron kills those that carry it. This, this is true. <laughs> the Aaron will kill you if you try to carry the Aaron like the holy you're carrying like the mish right the what english words what do they call it the tabernacle what do you call it in english the tabernacle tabernacle i feel like i i know that's a real word but for some reason i feel like i just made that up right now anyway they're carrying the aron hakadosh what am i talking about do you know? Do, do you know? I don't know that I know. So he also struck people with these two things for saying things about the Aaron. Um, fiery sparks actually emanated from the Aaron and consumed the Leviim who ignored any of the stringent laws of awe and reverence relating to it. The scoffers contracted Sa'arat or Zivut as a punishment for blaming these deaths on the Aaron rather than acknowledging the truth that the slain victims had been guilty. All right, Nida. The term Nida denotes separation or aloofness. A woman becomes a Nida through menstruation, childbirth, or uterine bleeding. She thereby becomes ritually impure and must count seven clean days and immerse herself in a mikvah in order to become purified. Excuse me. The husband is commanded to separate from his wife while she is Anida. So many laws about this. Um, you don't share the same bed. You do not touch each other. You don't even pass things directly to each other. There are some exceptions like a baby. You know, if you have a small child and you're going to pass it. But it's preferable to like put the child down and then the other spouse. Um, and there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of laws. It's fascinating. The laws of Nida, like all Torah laws, are beneficial for man. One of the benefits of the complete separation between the spouses during the Nida period is that it prevents the relationship from becoming habitual. As a result of this Torah law, the husband always regards his wife as dearly as a newlywed who just entered under the wedding canopy. Right. 
I mean, it does make sense, but we don't keep God's laws because they make sense, right? Um, I like, I'm, I'm from Texas. We've talked about this. I like steak. I do. I like steak very much, so much. It really gives me chi, you know, when I'm eating like a good piece of steak. I would not enjoy steak if I had to have it every day, every single day, together and apart. You build the longing that just makes good sense. You build the longing. And also, I mean, there's a lot of different benefits to it, but one is also that uh, in, a, in, in a marriage, half the month you're going to be working on your intimacy and that level of the relationship and the other half of the month you're going to be working on your friendship which is also really important in a romantic relationship so in that in that space you get best of both worlds because sometimes it's easiest to convey a feeling with a touch right but when you can't touch you have to use other ways you have to use your words and you have to use other ways to communicate and become close and I think that's a super swell thing Super swell. A woman who is careful with the laws of, of uh, impurity, well, we call it, the, the nice way to say it is we call it fam family purity laws. Family purity laws. <clears throat> In the Gemara, there's whole giant sections of study. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's really unbelievable. So a woman who is careful with these laws will merit bearing sons great in Torah knowledge who will be capable of rendering good halachic decisions. If she is negligent, she will be stricken with tzarat. Rachav, oh, I love this. Rachav. Ah. Okay. Rachav, who lived, uh, what, do you, what do you call it in English? Rahab? Rahab, how much do we have left? Ooh, maybe this video is going to be a little longer with my rambling. Anyway, Rahab, Hebrew it's Rahab, who lived in the Canaanite city of Jericho. Jericho. Was a prostitute by profession. She wasn't just a prostitute. She was like the prostitute. She was like the boss of the prostitutes. She was, I think there's one commentary that has the opinion that she's one of the most four beautiful women that ever lived. Like she was, wow, right? Like, wow. But when she learned that the Yamsuf had been miraculously split for the, uh, for, for the Jews to cross, she was profoundly affected and concluded that the Almighty is the true God who must be obeyed. Hashem saw her sincere desire to serve him and directed to Rahab's house the steps of the two Jewish spies who were sent by Yoshua to explore um, the land and the feelings of the inhabitants of the land. Although they were disguised, the fact that they were Jewish spies was soon discovered. The king of Jericho sent messengers to Rahab's house, ordering her to hand me over the two men who came to your house, for they came to spy on the land. Rahab now decided to risk her life in order to save those two Jews, thus making repentance for her past. After concealing them in stalks of flax lying on her roof, she returned to the king's messengers and told them, Such men did indeed come to my house, but I did not know who they were. They left at nightfall, just as the city gate was about to be closed. Pursue them quickly, and you shall surely overtake them. When the king's messengers had left in the direction of the Jordan, she climbed up to the roof and declared to the two spies, I know that Hashem gave you the land. For all the inhabitants of Canaan melted away with fear when they heard how he dried up for you the waters of the Yamsuf and how you wiped out the two Amorite kings, Sihon and Og, and no courage remained in any man. I know that Hashem your God is... And she's it's quoted... Uh, I, I've read in other books that this... Why it was so significant of what she says here is because it said that she was the first person 
to utter these words specifically. And so she said that, and so this was a very, very meaningful statement. I know that Hashem, your God, is the God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now swear that just as, I ha- just as I have showed you kindness, you shall repay me with kindness and truth when you conquer the land, and you shall spare me and my family from death. The spies swore, and she let them down from her window by means of a rope, for her house was situated in the city wall. She advised them to conceal themselves in the mountains until the king's men would abandon their pursuit and only then return to Yoshua. Rechav prayed, Master of the universe, I have sinned before you by neglecting three mitzvot, which are specific obligations of the woman. This is true. At the end of the day, women have three mitzvahs, three big things. It's bigger than, it, but three things. Nida, family purity laws, taking care of that. Taking care of the chalado, which also means that she needs to be on top of her kosher, her kosher laws, and and the way she cooks her food and prepares food for her family, and uh, lighting the Shabbos candles. These these three things, a woman has to light Shabbos candles because she brought the darkness into the world. So she has a, she has a, we would say tikkun, like a rep, a repair that she has to make by bringing more light into the world, also more children into the world. And so Rahab says, I sinned in three matters. Therefore, accept my repentance, which I express by rescuing these two men by three means, the rope, the window, and the city wall. Okay. Uh, when the Bnei Israel took possession of the land, Rechav converted uh, Lashem Shemaim for the sake of heaven and became the ancestress, uh, uh, the ancestress of eight famous prophets. You know who she married? You know who she married? She married Yoshua Ben Nun, the greatest prostitute of the time, married Yoshua Ben Nun the leader of the Jewish people. The most, well, I don't know if people would officially say he was the most righteous man, but he was definitely really, really up there if God chose him to lead the nation of Israel after Moshe Rabbeinu. What do you think of that for a match made? Because if somebody makes repentance, it's amazing, very interesting. Very, very interesting. So next, Zava. If a woman on one or two days experiences a flow of blood at an unusual time, not during her monthly cycle, she becomes a Zava. She is impure and defiles others. If the flow occurs on three consecutive days, she is termed a Zava Gadola, a big Zava. <clears throat> After termination of her sickness, she counts seven clean days and immerses herself in the mikvah. In the time of the Beit HaMikdash, she offered on the eighth day a sacrifice termed Korban Zaba, of the same type as that of a Zav. No sacrifice was prescribed for the Nida since her cycle constitutes the natural state after Chava's sin. However, the Zivut was considered a sickness and therefore a special sacrifice is required upon its termination to atone for the sin which caused her sickness. Our sages explain why a woman may be stricken <clears throat> as a Zava. She is punished thus for failing to examine herself when she anticipates the onset of her next cycle. She failed to fully cover the parts of her body, which according to our sages are considered erva, nakedness, displaying them before strangers. Um, So what's considered nakedness if you're married and your hair is uncovered? Um, Shirts need to be below the elbow. Um... When you sit down, your skirt or dress must hit below the knee when you sit. Um, And nothing too tight or attention grabbing. Um, What else? What else? That's, That's mostly it. I mean, there's different laws and different communities, but that's the general rule. Like if you wear a shirt with a collar, your collarbone's here. 
got to co cover those collarbones. And uh, yeah, also interesting. A woman's voice is also considered erva for men, nakedness for men. Women are not allowed to sing in front of men. That's what it is. But it can sing in a group of people together. Maybe is there an opinion that women can sing in a group together? Or there's also an opinion that uh, if it's like through the radio and not like live, it's different. But the truth is with things like this, every community will hold to um, a degree, a different degree. Totally off topic now. Purification of an end of, we are over time, but I only have a little left. Okay, purification of an individual who is tame. To complete his purification, a ritually unclean individual is obligated to immerse himself in a mikvah. The mikvah, in order to qualify, must be built according to halachic specifications and must contain a sufficient amount of rain or spring water for the entire body to be submerged at one time. Its volume at least 40 seya, which is about 24 cubic feet. Um, so a mikvah is a, it's a special pool that's built through, uh, there's a lot of rules about it. Also a natural body of water can be used as a purification place. All the laws of impurity and methods of purification are what we call hokim. And a hok is a law um, that is beyond our understanding. It's beyond human understanding of how it makes sense. Tuma should not be understood to be a type of physical uncleanliness which needs to be washed away by the waters of the mikvah. Rather, when purifying himself in the mikvah, a person should bear in mind that he or she does so in order to obey the will of the Creator who ordained that certain types of blood <clears throat> in issue are tome and others tahor. Some are pure and some are impure. That a certain type of water purifies whereas another doesn't, which is also like the laws of the red cow <coughs> whose ashes they would use to purify. But... Also, this is one of the things, this is like the one thing that Shlomo Amelech said he didn't understand in Torah law. The law of the red cow. If you sprinkled the ashes on somebody that was impure, they would become pure. But if you sprinkled the ashes on somebody that was already pure, they would become impure. So, what was I talking about? I'm all over the place today. <laughs> so it says that with the mikvah, Certain types of water purify and certain types of water do not. Uh, the 40 se'ah, the, um, the 24 cubic feet of the mikvah, uh, which constitute the minimum volume, hint to a person that he must purify himself on a dual level, spiritually as much as physically. <clears throat> the number 40 alludes to the physical creation of man since according to our sages, the embryo's formation takes 40 days and to spiritual renewal since the tablets were handed to Moshe after 40 days. The necessity for spiritual purification is also hinted at by the fresh waters of the mikvah. Our sages liken the Torah to fresh water. The purifying individual then is advised to immerse himself in the waters of the Torah. By upholding the laws of purity and ritual cleanliness, we enable the Shekhinah to reside in our midst. Wherever impurity prevails, the Shekhinah recedes. Three sinners cause the Shekhinah to depart from the world. When they then cry out to the Almighty, He does not respond because He is no longer close. The three are someone who performs abortions. He thereby contradicts the Creator's occupation, for He is constantly busy bringing new living beings into the world. And as a result of this sin, the Shekhinah withdraws an affliction by the sword, pestilence, and famine ensues. Performing abortions is forbidden not only to Jews, but to all humanity according to the Noahide laws. A Jew who lives with a non-Jewish woman, he thereby transgresses the, covenant, the, transgresses the covenant 
of the Brit Mila denying the special relationship between the Jewish people and Hashem. And three, a Jew who willfully lives with Anita since her Tuma is of the severest type. A Jew who is a Jew who is forced to commit this sin on threat of death must let himself be slain. That's how grave this is. Being with a woman that is Nida. Um, it said that even if somebody compels you to do this thing with your life, that you must give up your life in order not to commit this sin. He drives away the Shechina and endangers himself and the offspring to be born from the union, exposing it to physical and spiritual peril. Most of the uh, alachot of Tuma and Tahara do not apply nowadays. In practice, since after the temple's destruction, we lack the necessary means of purification. Yes. The laws of Nida, Zivud, and childbearing women, though, are in effect. Their fulfillment vital to the continued existence of the nation of Israel. <sighs> wow. Wow. All right, that was action-packed, I think. There was a lot of information in there. I was all over the place. Sorry about that. All right. We did it. We did it. Um, I hope you have a great day. I hope you have a great rest of your week. And what was that? Was there something else I was going to say? Don't remember. So until next time, my dear friends, so good to thank God.